Welcome to Gold Derby. I'm senior editor Denton Davidson here with Oscar-winning documentary filmmaker Morgan Neville to discuss Bono and the Edge, a sort of homecoming with David Letterman. And I just want to get right off into the theme of it all. What was the connection with you two and David Letterman? Because this could have just been easily a documentary about you two, but this was a really unique take for Bono and the Edge to invite Dave to Dublin and talk about their music in this way. So I, they'd gone back because they'd been on a show a number of times and um, I think they had always liked each other a great deal, but it's not like they had a deep, deep bond. I think it was more kind of fondness. And it was Bono's idea to reach out to Dave. And if I really think about it, I think it's, he kept saying, you know, the Dave's kind of ironic take was something that they liked the humor of it. And no. And I think they're also very aware that they can be a little sincere and that some sometimes kind of adding some irony to it is really helpful, you know, but, but what I pointed out to him was that I feel like, you know, you two's whole story is going from sincerity to irony and Dave's story is going from irony to sincerity. <laughs> so uh, Dave's, you know, much more kind of heartfelt, sincere, guy now certainly than when he started yeah. um but any it's just this kind of odd invite um but nobody knew what it was going to be or we weren't even sure if it was going to be in ireland entirely and then i talked to dave and when he said he'd never been to ireland i said well that just has to be it that has to be the framework is we're going to take a trip and then i'll make a documentary about it and then you get to weave his experience in Ireland with this great story of you two. I mean, we even see him buying a big cheese wheel for the first time. So you get that humor in the story. Um, what was your connection to you two then? Because I know you do a lot of music documentary and have a lot of music background, but what was that connection? I'm just as a fan, you know, I saw you two, I looked it up. I saw them on the war tour at the LA sports arena when I was 15 um and what is one of the first concerts i probably went to on my own with my friends um and have you know been a fan of theirs since you know i was a young teenager which is kind of the exact same time i became a fan of letterman's too yeah so it's interesting that they're both people i've tracked my whole life and i've seen you two many times on many different tours and have always kind of paid attention to what they were doing and so in a way i feel like it was a project i'd kind of been prepping for for 40 years <laughs> 35 years which is pretty great when that happens and i love the stories that they tell in this um they had this unique group of friends in high school that called themselves the lipton village and everyone got nicknames and that's where the edge came from um and bonos was from this hearing a store or something like that is what they said Exactly. What I love what I loved the most is that Adam was Mrs. Burns and Larry was Jam Jars. <laughs> so they didn't so they didn't keep their names. What was it? What was the most fascinating story for you? Or what did you love about just hearing them talk about this stuff? Well, the relationship between the band and Ireland is so interesting. That's the part that we really got to dig into. And it functions on a couple different levels. One is every Irish rock star who had ever made it before them had left Ireland to do it. And they not only made it while in Ireland, but after they made it, they didn't leave Ireland. And the relationship with the Irish is that kind of classic brother kind of situation where um, I'll take the piss out of you all day long, but if somebody else criticizes you, you know, I'll knock them down. So it keeps them humble being there, you know, that I think they're not gods in Ireland. They're, you know, people will, you know, they're kind of loved, but also kind of people take the piss at them all the time, as you might say in Ireland. Um, but I think the fact that they hung in there for that says something about them too. And they've kind of, you know, and never kind of left it and rededicated themselves to, to Dublin. And, and that part of it, I thought was fascinating. Um, just that what was the Irishness of it? You know, Bono had said that in America, you see somebody in a mansion on a hill and say, God, someday I'd love to live in that house. And in Ireland, you see somebody in mansion on the hill and say, I want to get that bastard. <laughs> so, <laughs> 
well, there's a tall, and, tall poppy syndrome, I think they call it, you know. And speaking of, you know, the Irishness of it all, another part that I liked was when Bono was literally drying out the history for Dave of, of the war um, and Northern Ireland and, and how everything is set up. And they talked about, um, you know, being religious, but not wanting to have like this, not wanting to be too religious. So they... So they joined this group called the Charismatic Renewal. Um, and then they were sort of torn between, you know, if they could do music or not. And that's what led the edge to write Sunday Bloody Sunday. Um, when you were, I mean, it was, it's a fascinating story. And then we get to see him play and it's crazy. Um, but when you are seeing that all play out with Bono and Dave uh, talking about this Irish history, did you talk about like, let's go in and talk about this? Did these things happen naturally or what was your format? Sure. I mean, before every interview, you know, we would talk a lot about what we wanted to get and what Dave was interested in, too. You know, and I think um, Dave was a little intimidated trying to digest a thousand plus years of Irish history into yeah. into a show, you know, and, and Dave is somebody who does homework and he was reading on Irish history. But I said to him, you know, you're not you don't need to be the expert here, Dave. You need to just be the the curious person who's trying to figure it out and kind of embrace that. Um, and I'd suggested to Bono that he have his iPad there and maybe could illustrate some things for Dave. And he loved that idea, but that was it. And then it, was, it just kind of happened as it happened beyond that. But I think it was the, the primer on... What what exactly, you know, how do exactly do we think of Ireland versus Northern Ireland? And, you know, I think a lot of for a lot of Americans and other people, it's it's a little blurry as to how that happens. And and even the fact that the actual Republic of Ireland is only 100 years old. <laughs> so even though it's a much older country, but the kind of the as a democracy and a, its own nation, it's it's um it's relatively new. And Bono and the Edge put together this show at the Ambassador Theater, and it's, I mean, this is not a stadium by any means. This is an, this had to be an incredible experience for the people that were there, because it's a very small space, and Bono and the Edge are in the center, and then you have this small crowd around them. What was that like, just to be in the room for that? I mean, it, it, it was actually, I, I, you know, we didn't know what we, they knew they wanted to perform, but we didn't know where, and Bono had suggested that theater, because, you know, the Rotunda Theater um, which was connected to the hospital where he was born. And, um, and, but the, there was kind of no plan. So it was up to us, a production to figure out, well, how are we, how do we want to do a concert, you know, in a venue that hasn't, you know, didn't even have seats, you know? So, um, but they had played me some of the music from Surrender and kind of the renditions and thinking about it and what it sounds like stripped down and I just kept thinking intimacy is what this is all about. And them being on stage and the audience being out of remove just felt wrong for what they were trying to do. And so I said, why don't you get on the floor and we'll surround you? You know, I think I even sent them some pictures of like the Elvis 68 comeback special and a few other things. And I was, wow. and I said, and we'll put cameras around. And if we see the cameras, it's fine. Like, we're not trying to pretend anything, you know, it's like, let's just, have this experience and they totally embraced it um and i will say it was one of my favorite shooting experiences i've ever had in my career like it was just it was amazing to be in a space that small and and to kind of see see the the charisma up close i i guess i mean it's you know that even in sound check it just there was no phoning it in you know it was like oh this is this is something something's going on here and on top of that they hadn't performed in years i mean i think somebody can fact check me on it but i don't think bono and edge had performed publicly in a number of years and they sound amazing yeah they no. sounded incredible and out of oh. you know this very stripped down setup you know they got such a sound how did you decide which performances just like how much is on the cutting room floor? Cause you know, you two fans are out there dying for this yeah. whole concert. Like what they're, they're, they're going to be pressuring you to put this whole thing out. 
Yeah. I mean, they didn't do 30 songs. You know, I think um, there are maybe two songs on the cutting room floor, maybe three. Um, and we had talked a lot about it because it was also trying to figure out songs that help tell the story, you know, so the songs that, you know, but, but one song, for instance, you know, was a, that Bono said he wanted to do, which was invisible. And I was always, I was not a huge song fan of that song. Um, and just the the original record, which is kind of a single they put out, and and Bono said, "No, I really want to do it." And when we went into sound check or even just rehearsals, and they started playing it, I thought, "Oh my god, this is an amazing song!" <laughs> and and I feel like on some of these songs, it was a chance to kind of rescue the song underneath the sound of you two. You know that there were certain songs that actually were shining better once you stripped off a lot of stuff that's not true of every song but i think a lot of times with you two songs it's it's hard to remember that there, oh there's actually an amazing song hiding underneath this sound right. and that was the perfect example you know that just yeah i'm so so happy that that bono suggested that and their friendship is incredible the, that the way that it's lasted so many years, you you talk to Bono a little bit about his activism. And if there was any sort of tension throughout the years, his activism is is probably at the core of, of most of that, um, which surprised me. I mean, I just kind of thought you two would, would all sort of have the same feelings, but they uh, had very divided feelings about some of the people that Bono was meeting with. Um, what was it like to talk about just their relationship and that activism with Bono? Well, the relationship, I think, is a total unicorn in rock and roll history yeah. that if you look at a lot of the other kind of um, great bands and songwriting teams, you know, they're fraught <laughs> almost always. And particularly, you know, in rock bands, you know, people tend to start collaborating when they're teenagers and they're kind of locked into perpetual adolescence in that relationship and they tend to resent it and um and somehow this is the opposite story like i actually think they're closer now than they've ever been i mean they said that and you know they vacation together they you know, talk every day you know multiple times a day you know it's it's a very unique relationship but i think it's also because they're so aware they both feel lucky i think and that's one thing that bono kind of expressed on stage for edge you know for bono being the front man with all the attention he's so grateful that edge is there to actually make it work and we had this one little um example when we we're talking about staging the concert we had had we had some zoom calls about it with bono and edge and you know bono is just throwing out crazy ideas right and left and you know we'll do this and we can do that and you know and then he says oh i have to go and then he leaves and then edge says um okay here's what we're really gonna do <laughs> and <laughs> and i felt like oh this is how the band works you know the bono um throws a lot of crazy ideas out there and leaves it up to edge to actually execute and and i think edge appreciates bono's ideation and energy and kind of vision um and and it's in its messiness and then edge is the opposite he is how do you focus focus execute make it happen and make it as good as you can and they both work insanely hard you know it's something i've seen in the rock stars i've been around in my life which is the real rock stars work incredibly hard you yeah. know uh and i saw it when we were there i mean even you know the day we shot the whole concert I'd mentioned to them that the next day we, I wanted to maybe look at some, listen to some voice memos of songs they were working on. And they stayed up till 3 a.m. writing a new song for Dave that night, <laughs> you know, which, you know, I, the, I was too tired to do something like that and I didn't perform a concert. So just seeing how people like that work up close is, 
it just leaves such an impression. So that's what I was trying to kind of give some glimpse of that, of like these, they're the real deal. Talk about the decision to uh, interview and bring in Panty Bliss. Um, she's an Irish drag queen and um, had an evolution of her own thoughts about what you two was and what they are now um, and what that means to be Irish. Uh, how did you decide to make her one of the subjects in the film? Well, the one marching order Bono gave me at the beginning was don't make this the kind of Irish tourist board version of Ireland. And I think a lot of Americans and other people have a very stereotypical vision of Ireland of, you know, old men with sheep and quilted caps and, um, and that Ireland is a very modern country in a lot of ways, in ways that we haven't caught up to. So with that in mind, looking at Ireland, you know, and and particularly when it comes to things like um, dealing with, with gay rights, that Ireland is ahead of most countries. And, and in a way, this film was about their relationship with Ireland and kind of how they were both reflective of the change in Ireland, but also a catalyst for some of that change. And um, my producer, uh, Seamus, who is Irish, said, oh, Panny would be perfect to talk to about this. Uh, and Panny was amazing to talk to about it. And it was kind of the perfect distillation of that relationship of how Irish people feel about the band, how Ireland is perceived as it was backwards until it wasn't backwards till it was forwards, you know, and, and, um, and I think, you know, rather than just doing the more kind of YouTube documentary thing where you just interview the producers and all the kind of spouses or whatever, it, it was kind of the freedom to say, we're not doing the YouTube documentary. We're doing this slice of looking at relationships between Bono and Edge, between the band and the, their country. Um, and in that way, it was really freeing because we're just sketching, you know, it didn't have to be encyclopedic. And you won an Oscar for uh, 20 Feet from Stardom. And I'm just curious about what that night was like for you. What's the What was the wildest, craziest thing that happened that night other than actually winning the Oscar? I mean, what was the most bizarre thing that you stumbled on at the oscars that night oh there were so many amazing things you know um you know after winning the oscar and ending up in an elevator with bradley cooper who had given it to us and kind of suddenly having this quiet moment where you're like did that just happen the elevator opened and bill murray was standing there and said congrats and like hugged me you know it was all just so strange i think we ended up the night at a diner at 4 a.m. with my Oscar and everybody in the diner came to have their picture taken. We had a big group picture with the Oscar at the diner at 4 a.m. So, you know, it was it was pretty incredible. Um, and for the women in the film, too, it it totally I mean, the whole experience of that film, I think, changed everybody's life in a way that was pretty magical. Yeah, I love that movie. Um, well, Morgan, congratulations on another film. It's it's really fun and captivating to watch it's available to stream now on disney plus and hulu and best of luck to you at the emmys and thanks for chatting with gold derby today thanks so much great talking to you